Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. We're not so different, you and I. Admit it. You love the danger as much as I do. Hi, Matt. This is Kira. I really need you to call me back because I'm working on that calendar of cats doing JoJo poses, and I really need you to get your cats to just pose and do something menacing, like the more menacing the better. So let me know when you get this. On the line, we have Kira Buckland talking to us from... Where are you talking to us from, Kira? I'm in Southern California. Wonderful. Wonderful. That wasn't the answer I was expecting you to say, but there we go. Oh, where do you think I was from? I thought you were going to say Alaska. No, I, I was born and raised there, but I moved out here to do voice work. I think you are the first person I've ever interviewed who is from Alaska. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Obviously, it's Anchorage, Alaska, is where you're from. What is Alaska actually like? I know it's cold, but is it as cold as people say it is? In the winter, yeah, but in the summer and fall, it's super beautiful. I really miss it a lot. My parents still live there, so I get back and visit a couple times of the year. I was hoping to go around this month, but, I mean, it's both a blessing and a curse. Work got super, super busy, and I was kind of, like, booked for stuff every day, so there was no way that I could go out of town because that would be a problem for all the current projects that I'm in. So hopefully I can go in like December or something when it slows down, but I do really miss it. Where I live now, it's like as hot as David Bowie outside and here it gets nice in the winter, but I really don't like this super, super hot stuff, especially because I play Pokemon Go. When I go out and raid today after this, I'm like, oh, it's too hot. And you're also the second person that has actually admitted to having Pokemon Go. <laughs> Oh, I am very open about my Team Mystic pride. Funnily enough, there is a sort of a connection to your voice acting career there, isn't there? Because you did Detective Pikachu. Yeah, I guess you could you could say that, which was super, super cool, because obviously I've been into the Pokemon franchise for a long time. Since the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite that long for me, but I used to be one of the gym leaders for the Pokemon League in my hometown. With regards to your voice acting career and obviously your anime career as well. What made you want to get into it in the first place? Well, it definitely was around the time when I was a teenager and started getting into, like, anime and video games and kind of realizing that people do the voices for that sort of thing because I think when we're younger, we don't really think about it. You know, if we watch a show or something like that, we don't really think about, like, oh, it's people doing the voices constantly. We're just, like, we're just watching the show, you know. Back then and, like, you know, 2004 or whatever, there wasn't all this information out about it. You know, now there's so many resources. I even run a whole Discord server and forum myself for people who are kind of getting into this or trying to take their career to the next level. But, you know, back when I started, it was kind of like you didn't necessarily even know who a lot of the voice actors were. It was just kind of this, like, thing that some people did, and it was sort of a mystery on how to get into it. For anyone who doesn't know what Discord is, because it is something relatively new, even I've only just got into it, so I, I do know what you're talking about. How would you sort of describe it? It's, it's sort of like an online gaming anime community, isn't it? Yeah, it's like a chat server. It's super great. You know, I use it for pretty much everything now, even for Pokemon Go raids. Like, I'm on a server for my hometown... Well, my hometown and where I currently live, and I can look up and see where people are raiding. So if we're raiding a legendary and we need, like, at least six people, that's how I find them. Now, I'm going to sort of go a bit weird here with this interview, but I think you might you might have a clue what, what I'm referring to. I've got to talk about something that's happened this week in terms of, of gaming. It's Bowsette. <laughs> Who, in their right mind, made this up or thought it was a great idea? I mean, they had to know. Like, that's all I'll say is they had to know. You know, that was my first thing when my friend was like, oh, did you see that yet? And I was like, oh, no, what's going on? And he explained it to me. And I was like, yeah, how long until people draw? And he's like, oh, it's already happened. Trust me. And saying that, obviously, you get the wonderful, I say wonderful, cosplay um, people. 
<laughs> we won't name certain people. We know which ones we're talking about, I think, Kira. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> He's sort of taking it a bit too literally, I think. A bit too literally. But in terms of cosplay, again, you're another person who is the first person I've interviewed who actually cosplays. Mm-hmm. I've only just got into cosplaying. I mean, I went to Manchester Comic Con. Manchester Comic yeah, Con. Yeah, I actually was hoping they'd invite me one of these years, but it never ended up happening. It's amazing how many how many people actually dress up as certain characters and try and do the moves and try and do the accents. They have this huge love of of, of anime. Yeah, or even other things, because, you know, people also dress up as game characters. Mm. Anything that you could possibly think of. I was cosplaying David Bowie at an event recently, and I met another guy who was cosplaying a different David Bowie persona, so I was like, oh, I'm so happy. What is it about cosplaying that, that you like? I don't know. I guess, like, I'm really into makeup and stuff, and I just love being able to kind of, I don't know, just, like, really go all out. Like, I've always been big on, you know, kind of like the outrageous looks or whatever and the more fun that I can have with something the better I guess but also I don't know like I I just feel more confident when I can you know like put on like a cute wig and really go all out with my makeup and get super you know glammed up or whatever and I think another thing that I like about it is it's a great way to meet people who are into the same things that you are I'm super obsessed with Jojo's Bizarre Adventure and my friends in real life get annoyed with me talking about it nonstop. So if I'm, you know, cosplaying from Jojo or something and I see other Jojos, that's kind of like a way to make friends and meet people. I mean, it's such an interesting thing because you have those bigger comic cons where people dress up as Captain Kirk. But cosplaying yeah. seems to have sort of taken a whole sort of different mode, if that makes sense. I mean, you'll have like battles between characters, for example. Oh, yeah, it's Mm. huge. And, you know, people are doing it for a career now, which you never would have expected so many years ago. I mean, the the cost in actually making these costumes has got to be a bit high if you want to actually get the actual proper props and all that stuff. Oh, for sure. I've only made a few of my own costumes because I'm really not good at it. So a lot of times I'll have to, like, buy costumes. But for certain characters, they don't have, like, good pre-made costumes that you can buy. So that's kind of what encouraged me to at least try, like, learning to sew and stuff like that. With your voiceover career, have you encountered people who are basically doing your character? Oh, yeah, all the time. 2B from Near Automata is a super popular character to cosplay. You know, when somebody's costume is really, really good of a character that I played, sometimes I really want to be like, oh, yeah, like, I did the voice or whatever, but I kind of have to hold back from that because there's a lot of people who only want to watch her play in the original language, which is totally valid. Like, as long as you're not being a jerk about it, I don't care if you played near in Japanese and preferred it that way. Like, whatever, that's the original language. But, you know, I, I have to be careful if I'm, like, saying stuff because then there's always going to be people who are like, Oh, yeah, I only watched the sub, or I only played it in Japanese. Well, the other interesting thing, and um, I find this really interesting, actually, is the fact that you founded a anime conference, con, whatever you want to call it, when you were a high, high school student, weren't you? And now um, one of my friends back home runs it. He's been in charge of it for a long time, and he's great at what he does, and it's blown into like this huge thing. I usually try to staff there, but this year I couldn't make it because I had another convention that wanted me as a guest. So, you know, obviously that had to take priority. What would you say makes a good con? Um, I think organization is a really, really big thing because whenever a con grows, you'll have different departments and these departments need to be communicating with each other because there's always crossover. And I've seen this from both like a staff perspective and as like a guest perspective or even as an attendee. You know, if you don't have that sort of communication, then, you know, things get misscheduled. I think advanced preparation is really important because if people, you know, for example, I apply to panel at a lot of conventions and Half the time, it's like we won't even know if our panels were approved or denied or when they are until like a few weeks before the con. And it's like, well, we have to be able to plan our schedules for the event. We have to know what they're doing. Some people like are waiting to see if they'll even like buy a badge or go to the event until they know if their panel got approved. 
you know, power tripping sometimes can be a thing. You want to make sure that your staff are, I don't know, that they just act with integrity, I guess you could say. It's something that, you know, even running a community online that I definitely look for in the moderators and admins that we have, you know, people who are like, okay, if I'm mediating this conflict, can I, can I approach it in a way that's courteous to people involved and, you know, uphold the rules or standards however I need to, but also not, you know, be insulting to people, abuse my authority, like all that kind of stuff. So I think it's important to have, you know, your higher up people, you know, be kind of doing this for the right reasons, not because they want power, they want, you know, claim to fame or whatever the deal is. At the end of the day, it is about making sure everyone has a good time. Yeah. Is there one particular character that you have done that you've enjoyed the most? Yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed so many of the characters that I've played, but I think the one that's made the biggest impact on my career is definitely 2B, because that's kind of, you know, the one that people started knowing me for, like the one where me and my friend Kyle, who played 9S, we started getting, like, letters and gifts from people who were like, this game, like, changed my life, and I don't know, I've never, in all the works that I've done, had something that affected people that much and you know of course I don't like take credit for that as the actor that's the storytelling the writing all that kind of stuff but it was just really cool to be a part of that in some way this is always a fun question you've probably been asked this dozens of times too many times we're gonna ask it again what advice would you give to anyone wanting to pursue a career in voice acting so um, there's two pieces of advice that I give. The first one, I think any actor will tell you, I'm sure, you know, you've heard this on your previous podcast from other actors, but it's reiterating the same point for a reason, and that's you have to be an actor. The most important part of voice acting is the acting. Um, a lot of people say, well, I have a nice voice, or I can do a lot of voices, or I can do impressions of Dragon Ball Z characters, or whatever they're into, and like all that stuff is fine and good, but that's not what's going to get you hired you have to be able to take a character and portray them believably have lines on a page bring them to life even sometimes with little context and no opportunity to prepare you have to be able to act well you know in a room just with the director for example because we don't record together so you're not having the other actors to play off of you know, a lot of people say they want to go into this because they want to do anime, which is which is fine. I mean, there's a lot of work in that market, but it's very, very technical and difficult because matching to picture is not as easy as a lot of people think it is, especially when it has to be super precise. And, you know, there's a bunch of things to think about at the same time. You know, the hardest part I think about voice acting is just finding the work. You don't just like get in with one place and that's it like you have to constantly be looking for jobs because we're freelancers I just wrote like a huge article about this um shameless plug but you guys can all find them on voiceactingclub.com and I wrote like a bunch of articles there about things Mm, mm, mm. how do you approach a game an anime obviously I've been doing this a while now so I can sort of understand that if it's a if it's a Japanese anime they give you a sort of pretext as to what the character is they'll give you a few scenes maybe to watch I mean how would you approach a voice itself when you're obviously watching and thinking okay how am I gonna voice this well a lot of times we will get an audition first and a lot of the auditions are done from home these days and you don't have to sync it up to picture for the audition but they'll send you like a few scenes and there will be a reference clip for each scene. So if I'm getting an audition that I'm doing at home, I'll usually kind of like watch through all the reference clips they sent first. You know, there might be like two or three of them, depending on how big the character is. And they'll be like a couple minutes long each or whatever. So I'll go through those and kind of get the feeling of like, okay, what did the original actor do in Japanese? You know, what does their personality seem to be like? There will usually also be like a little write-up on the audition sheet, which says like a paragraph or two about the character and kind of, you know, their personality, maybe a little about their background. So, you know, it's not always like a ton of information, but I will say like, okay, here's the information I have. Here's like the informed choice I'm going to make based on all I have here to go off of. And, you know, I'll do like a few 
takes and then go back and listen and then either choose my best one or be like, oh, I'm not really happy with how I did this line, so we'll go ahead and do that. And then usually if we get informed that we were cast for the part, we'll go into the studio and they'll like play our audition for reference. And sometimes they'll say, we like what you did in your audition, so do something along those same lines. Or they'll say, hey, we liked your audition, but we want to make this change. Like maybe we want to make the character a little younger, a little older, you know. Oh, um, they sound too, um, I don't know, like sometimes with female characters, like, oh, they sound too sexy. Can we take that out of the voice or, you know, whatever. So usually when we're in there, they might show us like a little bit, like a few lines and then say, okay, try, try something based on what you heard. And we'll just like get levels and kind of, you know, see if that's where we want to take the voice. But normally we will preview line by line. So we will kind of like watch the line in Japanese, see it for timing and, you know, kind of see what the actor did or whatever. And then we will go and do the line right after. They'll see if it fits or not, see if the director has any changes they want to make. And then, you know, we'll do it like that. You mentioned obviously watching the reference clips and looking at how they're doing the Japanese voice obviously you graduated in Japanese didn't you Mm -hmm. does it help knowing Japanese when you're approaching that kind of role it's definitely not a necessity I mean you know there's some actors who know varying degrees of Japanese and there's some who don't you know I think it is helpful just in terms of you know kind of understanding like oh this is what they're saying in Japanese like obviously it's already translated and adapted when we get into the booth but kind of I don't know, it just adds another layer of like, okay, here's what's going on that I can draw from. It also helps because we have to pronounce a lot of Japanese names and words, you know, but it's not foolproof because sometimes they're like, oh, we want to like Americanize it a little. And then I have to remember to like not pronounce it really properly, but it does help overall. And I don't know, just like even understanding it like culturally and stuff, like certain things in shows will make sense to me that might not make sense to someone who's not familiar with language or culture of Japan at all. But, you know, you can get some of that even just from watching a lot of that type of media. But I've also worked on other language dubs, like I've done like Chinese dubs, Russian dubs, French, all that kind of stuff. And I have found that it's a little helpful if you know at least some of the source language. You know, it's not like it's harder for me per se if I'm doing a Russian dub as opposed to, like, a Japanese dub or whatever, but I think it does help to just know a little bit of the language. Isn't anime just a universal language at the end of the day? (laughs) I mean, that's, uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it, but, yeah, I would say that there's definitely, like, certain things in it that if someone were just going in and didn't have any experience either, like, watching anime or, like, knowing anything about Japanese culture, they might be like what is this? I don't get what's going on here. Or even understanding the archetypes that come up in anime, which, um, you know, can just come from knowing the genre. You don't have to know the language necessarily. But that, I think, goes for anything that you want to work in. Like, if people want to do, I don't know, like, say they want to work in fighting games, which is something that's always been a passion of mine. Like, play these games, get an idea of how this stuff sounds, or if you're like, I can't afford the game, or I'm not good at it, then, like, you know, look it up online, look up some playthroughs or whatever, and kind of like study the the archetypes and the performances in the genres you want to work in, because it really does help. Like, you don't have to be a gamer to work in video games, but if you know, like, some of the terminology and stuff, then that just makes it easier for you, because if you see something that it's like, oh, the character is leveling up after gaining experience in battle, like, you know what that is. You don't have to be like, um, what is this? <laughs> I mean, you mentioned Americanization. That rings true of a few of my sort of previous interviews about how they adapt the Japanese anime into something that the American audience can understand. Do you think it sort of takes away anything from the Japanese original? I think it really depends on the target audience and what you're going for. If people are trying to do something that's, like, specifically aimed at children and they need it to go on network TV, there are certain rules that they have to follow that might not even be within their control. You know, like, a lot of people say, well, you know, Pokemon was super Americanized and, you know, whatever, but, like, look how well it did over here. I think less and less that's becoming the case. 
like, you know, people are trying to stay true to the source material and it's important to the clients, but especially for stuff that's not specifically aimed at kids, I think the viewers really want, you know, something that's true to the original. They don't want the names changed for no reason. They don't want certain scenes censored for no reason with, you know, certain exceptions. Like there's, there's some cases where I think if something's really, really content that's not considered acceptable over here, then, you know, then cutting it out might be a reasonable choice, you know, not just for the sake of it. Like if there's cultural things in there, whatever, like leave it in. It doesn't hurt people to learn about something that's not, you know, just from where they live. And, um, I think the other thing too, is that localization, you know, sometimes you just have to do it the best that you can, like in terms of the people writing and adapting the script, because sometimes there will be like a joke or a reference that just won't make sense over here. And it's up to them to kind of decide, okay, do we want to like try to adapt this in a way that will make sense to viewers? Or do we want to leave in this obscure reference that will like fly over their heads? You know, you just, you don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's take a case in point. I think the most obvious recent one I can think of that has sort of an anime to American translation was Death Note. I like Death Note, I really do. I could see what they did in the Netflix adaptation. I could see what they were trying to do. Do you think it worked, Kira? No, that was like a totally different beast. You know, I hate watched it just because I wanted to see how bad it was. There's talks of an Akira adaptation. God knows what that's going to be like. I feel like if they're really going to make um, like a live-action adaptation of something, then if you're going to try to change stuff a lot from the original and Americanize it, then just have it loosely based on that story. You don't even have to like call it the same thing or whatever. You know, Just have it like, oh, inspired by this. But if you say it's like, oh, this is an adaptation, like, of course people are going to hate it. Dare they say they do a near one, but you'd think, potentially they might do uh i don't know i mean Mm. because even the ones that are made in japan are sometimes kind of not always great it just depends but like the ones over here i think the other problem too is when you have characters that are very decisively japanese in the original source material and they're like oh let's let's make them all white guys why not like that's kind of another problem with it i watched the uh, super mario brothers movie last night Oh, yeah, that one was pretty funny. Why? (laughs) Just why? My friend showed it to me one time when I was visiting back home, and it was, like, one of those, like, so bad it's good type of things. There is another question I did have for you. To be honest, I don't know, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. Have you tried mocap yet? No, I would love to. Not entirely sure how to get into that. Maybe if there's, like, a, a class on it or something here, I'll... I'll try to look into taking that. That's sort of the next step for voice actors, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that'd Mm. be super awesome. Or just working on, like, AAA Western games in general. I mean, I love working on JRPGs and mobile games and stuff. Don't get me wrong. I'm, like, super passionate about it. But I think sometimes there would be something really freeing if I could go in and work on a game where I'm the first, like, voice of the character where I'm not always going to be compared to or having to imitate somebody else's performance. Because, you know, with a lot of the media, especially that was originally done in Japanese, the fans get very much like, oh, the original is so much better, like the English sucks. Like you can never please people who are determined to feel that way. But if you're the first voice of a character, like if it comes out here first, then that's just the character's voice. And I find that people are much less critical of, oh, this doesn't fit, or this, you know, this and that. Like, they'll have opinions, sure, but they're not constantly comparing you to other actors in other languages. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Kira. One-minute plug to plug anything else that you've got coming up this year. I mean, I would actually throw in the fact that you were in Street Fighter Five because I've just recently purchased it, even though it's been three years ago since it's been released. Yeah, um, I definitely think that even if you guys have been off the Street Fighter V bandwagon for a while, you should definitely get the Season 3 pass, or at least by Falk, because she's my girl, and it would mean a lot to me if you guys like played her and maybe kind of tweeted your thoughts or showed your gameplay videos or something that you're really proud of. I have another really cool thing coming this year, but unfortunately I can't talk about it until the game is actually out, so that'll be... All over my social media when it's out, you won't be able to miss it. 
And then, I don't know, I've been playing a lot of Shadowverse, which is a mobile game, and I play, like, 12 of the different cards in that. So, I don't know, you guys should play that also just because it's fun. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I left this question till the end, Kira. Don't panic, don't panic. I think you'll enjoy it. Which is your favourite David Bowie song? <gasps> yes! I approve of this question. Um, (laughs) So my favorite song of all time is from, it's actually from my favorite album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, which is one of his, if not his most famous albums. But the song itself is actually really underrated. And I'm probably one of the only people I've met who was like, oh, this is my favorite song of his, but it's the track that's just called Star. Not Black Star. No, it's, it's just called mm. Star. I mean, of course, I do love Black Star, but that's totally different. Mm. So you're sort of more the uh, early Bowie. Well, I love all his music, but um, I think his 70s stuff in general is my favorite because that was just like his prime, you know, just producing amazing stuff, so many albums, so many different um, sounds that he experimented with. What a shame he's no longer with us. I know, I miss him so much, every, every single day. Funny enough, actually, there is a bit of an interesting connection with uh, me and sort of Bowie, not many people might know of. In my hometown, in the UK, it's not here where I am now, but in my hometown in the UK, they've actually got a David Bowie monument. Oh, is it in Brixton? Because I just got to visit there. No. <laughs> it's not in Brixton, but basically they've got this, um, yeah, they've got this um, David Bowie monument from when he played, I think he played at the theatre or, or something in the 70s, and they've obviously put this this monument up, and it plays it plays the top hits, I think they, I think they just chose all the top hits that, that he had, and uh, it plays every hour. Oh, yeah, I remember seeing articles about that. That is so cool. I wish I could go see that because um, I did get to see, like, they have a big mural and stuff in Brixton right around where he grew up. So I, you know, made a point to see that when I visited England for the first time last month. I want to go and see, like, everything someday. Like, I want to go see where the Ziggy album was recorded and all that kind of stuff. Well, Kira, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Obviously, we'll have to get you back. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe in a couple of years I'll have some really big credits. Who knows? That that's happened in the past with people who interviewed me before New York came out or whatever. You can't give us any hints as to what the project is, can you? <laughs> oh, I wish I could, but <laughs> but soon. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks very much for your time. All right, thank you so much. Bye bye now. Bye.